and welcome to the world today on channels television i'm ann Mwawado right here in lagos here's what's coming up on the program today japan begins releasing treated radioactive water from the wrecked fukushima nuclear power plant into the pacific ocean plus BRICS group of countries invites Argentina, Egypt, Iran, Ethiopia, Saudi Arabia and the UAE to become new members of the bloc. Welcome back. Japan has begun the release of treated radioactive water from the wrecked Fukushima nuclear power plants into the Pacific Ocean, a polarizing move that prompted China to announce an immediate blanket ban on all seafood imports from Japan. Aerial footage from the helicopter shows the crippled plant and rows of tanks filled with water ready to be released into the ocean. Signed off two years ago by the Japanese government and approved by the United Nations nuclear watchdog last month, the discharge is a key step in the dauntingly long and difficult process of decommissioning the Fukushima Daiichi plant after it was destroyed by a tsunami. Plant operator Tokyo Electric Power said the release began at about 1 p.m. local time and it had not identified any abnormalities with the seawater pump or surrounding facilities. And as we have mentioned before, China is not happy with Japan's decision. Once again, the foreign ministry has voiced strong opposition and condemned this decision to start releasing treated water from the Fukushima nuclear plant into the Pacific Ocean. Well, China says the disposal of the contaminated water is a major nuclear safety issue with cross-border implications and is by no means a private matter for Japan alone. Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin says that there is no precedent for man-made discharge of water polluted by nuclear accidents into the ocean, nor an accepted disposal standard. And for the Japanese Prime Minister, Fumio Kishida, he said he requested for China to immediately lift import ban on aquatic products and is seeking a science-based discussion on the impact of the water release. Japan exported about $600 million worth of aquatic products to China last year, making it the biggest market for Japanese exports, with Hong Kong second, the sales to China and Hong Kong accounted for 42% of all Japanese aquatic exports in 2022. China's customs did not give details on the specific aquatic products impacted by this ban and they did not immediately respond to a request for any comment. I've talked about Hong Kong's reaction to this story earlier, but dozens of people have marched through a financial district brandishing banners opposing the Fukushima water release. The protest is coming as Japan started discharging three treated radioactive water from the Fukushima nuclear power plant into the Pacific Ocean, which is a move that has drawn fresh and fierce criticism from China. Chants of Fumio Kishida also immediately stepped down, were heard as the protesters, including mostly elderly, marched across the pedestrian footbridge from Hong Kong's central station. Hong Kong ban began an import ban on Japan seafood from 10 prefectures on Thursday, which is a move it says is precautionary for safeguarding public health. But the special administrative region is still permitting food imports from 13 other regions, but they are subject to strict testing and monitoring. In other developments, the Japanese government today issued an emergency warning over the J-Alert broadcasting system for residents of the southern prefecture of Okinawa following North Korea's space rocket launch. While the launch also prompted an emergency warning in Japan just before 4 a.m. local time over the J-Alert broadcasting system, they've been telling residents to take cover indoors. About 20 minutes following that alert, the Japanese government followed up with a notice that the missile had passed through towards the Pacific Ocean and lifted the emergency warning. North Korea's second attempt to place a spy satellite in orbit failed on Thursday. Uh, that's after the rocket booster experienced a problem during the third stage. State media reported that space authorities vowed to try again in October this year. Its first try in may also end in failure. Uh, the first try in May this year ended in failure 
when the new Cholema-1 rocket crashed into the sea. From there, let's head to South Africa to check on the BRICS summit holding there. The country's minister in the presidency for electricity, Mr. Ngosiencho Ramokoba, has signed a joint memorandum of cooperation, that's an MOC, with the Chinese entities on behalf of the government of South Africa. The MOC entered into in the signing ceremony in Johannesburg was with eight Chinese entities, which are set to be global leaders in the energy space. The agreements are part of South Africa's efforts to improve power supply. The signing takes place on the sideline of the 15th BRICS summit, a day after China's state visit to South Africa. Mr. Ramokoba also says that South Africa is already benefiting from the summit. Oh, well, uh, we're already drawing the fruits ourselves from an electricity point of view. We signed the two agreements. Today we signed the eight agreements. I did say from an emergency, uh, um, if you like, energy solutions, we are getting those uh, units. Uh, the South African public is going to get the benefit of that. We are resolving the financing, the technology element, so and the technical expertise and industrialization on the back of, uh, of the crisis. The Chinese will help us to do that. I must hasten to indicate that we are talking to all the member BRICS countries, by the way. Although today the signing was with the Chinese because it was more advanced, when we conclude with others, we'll also make it public. And it just coincides with the BRICS summit, really. It's just a genuine coincidence. As you know, we're out there in China, concluded this uh, conversation. The shipment left even before the BRICS uh, uh, we could sign yesterday. So that's a testimony to the fact that these conversations were happening. So the biggest benefit is for us to reduce the intensity of load shedding and ultimately to end load shedding in South Africa. Although we're signing today, but they've already been helping me. They've gone to some of the power stations, generated the report. I'll still share that with Cabinet on how best to make those interventions. The second one is on the transmission side. Uh, the state grid is the biggest power utility in the whole world. Um, they've got the significant expertise, they modernize the technology. So there is no better person to have a conversation with other than the state grid. And you know that China has got about 688 gigawatts of renewable energy sources. We just have 66 gigawatts, which is a, a tenth of what China has built. So they're going to share with us on the best ways of bringing renewable generation capacity on stream. And then we're going to have a conversation on the financing of that. So mm -hmm. to make sure, I mean, we need over 210 billion rents or if you like about the 12 to 15 billion US dollars to finance the expansion of the grid. ESCOM is not sitting with that money. The national um, uh, fiscal matrix uh, could not, cannot accommodate that. So we need to design optimal financing solutions to make it possible for us to draw into the liquidity that sits with China and major industrialized countries. And that's why we are having this conversation and China will help us in addition to the donation of the equipment, about 552 units are coming into the country. 450 of those are already in transit, will be able to provide clinics, hospital, correctional services, uh, and schools, uh, alternative sources of supply. When there's load shedding, they will continue to have electricity. So that's what we're doing now. In total, is uh, 552 is uh, gas um, generators, diesel generators, uh, mobile uh, power units, uh, and also a package of PV and uh, battery. Uh, energy storage uh, units, uh, uh, they range from 6 kilowatts, these are small ones, to about 200 kilowatts. They can help us uh, to provide the energy to hospitals and, cl and clinics. Uh, so we are, we are, we are very uh, confident about um, uh, the solutions that the Chinese have offered. We have already concluded the technical assessment. They meet all of uh, our requirements because that was a, a precondition just to say stipulate what you want. Uh, Meanwhile, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres today told the summit that today's global governance structures reflects yesterday's world and that for multilateral institutions to be universal, they need to reform. For the recognition of the equality of all nations. Today's global governance structures reflect yesterday's world. They were largely created in the aftermath of World War II when many African countries were still ruled by colonial powers and were not even at the table. And this is particularly true of the Security Council of the United Nations and the Bretton Woods institutions. 
for multilateral institutions to remain truly universal, they must reform to reflect today's power and economic realities and not the power and economic realities of the post-Second World War. In a fracturing world with overwhelming crises, there is simply no alternative to cooperation. We must urgently restore trust and revigorate multilateralism for the 21st century. And this requires the courage to compromise in the reforms that are necessary for the common good. We are very proud that the country of Africa the Russian President Vladimir Putin is attending the summit virtually from Moscow, ignoring, while well, he has not ignored news of Prigozhin's death, as will be telling you details of his latest reaction. He told the BRICS summits in Russia that Russia intends to deepen ties with African countries and that it will remain a reliable partner for food and fuel supplies. In a video link address, Mr. Putin said that Russia was interested in developing multifaceted ties with Africa, which has been roiled by fuel and food price rises resulting from the conflict in Ukraine. Russia's July exit from the Black Sea grain deal has seen grain prices increase, hitting many African countries very hard. Russia and Ukraine are among the world's biggest grain exporters. In his remarks, Mr. Putin said that Russia had more than 30 energy projects in African countries. He also added that Russian fuel supplies will help African governments contain the high prices. Mr. Putin added that the global transition to a greener, low-carbon emission economy would have to be gradual, balanced, carefully calibrated, given projections from further growth in the world's population and energy demand. In the meantime, Chinese President Xi Jinping has said the China's financial institutions will soon launch a special fund of 10 billion US dollars to implement the Global Development Initiative. It says that China will carry out more cooperation with African countries and support Africa in enhancing its self-development capabilities. And this includes providing a complete set of data products for satellite mapping. And as part of the BRICS expansion, six new countries have been invited to join the bloc from January next year. This one is announced by South African President Cyril Ramaphosa. The debate over the expansion of the BRICS bloc has stopped the agenda at the summit in Johannesburg, South Africa. The BRICS nations include Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. It will open its arms to its new members namely Argentina, Egypt, Iran, Ethiopia, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. We have decided to invite the Argentine Republic, the Arab Republic of Egypt, the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, the Islamic Republic of Iran, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Arabia and the United Arab Emirates to become full members of BRICS. The membership will take effect from the 1st of January 2024. News just in says that uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin has spoken for the first time about yesterday's plane crash. He sends his condolences to the families of the dead, describing Wagner Group founder Yevgeny Prigozhin as a talented businessman. In a televised speech, Mr. Putin says investigators will continue to look into what happened, but that it will take some time. He also says he will... To, uh, he was told about Wednesday's plane crash on Thursday morning. Mr. Putin also says, as far as he's aware, Prigozhin only yesterday returned from Africa. He met certain official persons there. In recent days, the Wagner boss is believed to have been present in West Africa, where Western analysts fear the group was seeking to widen its reach into other countries, including Niger, where a coup has just taken place. The Wagner group is a key pillar of Russian foreign policy, with its forces helping to prop up governments in Syria, Mali, 
and Central African Republic and Libya in exchange for lucrative mining rights. Welcome back. Eight Republican presidential candidates traded barbs on Wednesday at their first debate of the 2024 election as they jockeyed for position behind the absent frontrunner, who is Donald Trump, who would um, prevent was didn't attend the event in a pre-trapped interview aimed at siphoning away viewers. Well, the rancor were went on for two hours. That debate offered a view of the deep challenges of contenders that they face in seeking to dislodge Mr. Trump from his perch at the top of the field. While the former president took the extraordinary step of skipping that debate entirely, his rivals were left taking shots at one another to try to emerge as a most viable alternative five months before the first Republican presidential nominating contest in Iowa and more than 14 months before the election later this year. My message to Gen Z voters is it will take somebody of a different generation to shake this up, and you saw it on the stage tonight. Do you want a super PAC puppet with a bunch of pre-prepared lines, or do you want an independent patriot who speaks the truth? And my other message to Gen Z is you don't have to agree with me on 100% of what I say, but if you agree with 80% of what I said in there, and you know that I actually mean what I say 100% of the time. That's what it's going to take to reunite this country. This cannot be another 50.1 tug of war decided the Monday after the election on cable news election. It just can't. We're skating on thin ice. And if you look at the way I've been running this campaign, the places we've been going where other Republican candidates won't touch, from the south side of Chicago to Kensington in the middle of the inner city of Philadelphia, we are building a multi-ethnic working class majority to deliver a moral mandate like Ronald Reagan did in 1980. Because I spoke authentically and I didn't come with canned slogans. And the reality is, it's good. you know what, if you're not willing to face off authentically with your fellow compatriots on the debate stage or NBC News or whoever, wherever you all are from for that matter, you're not ready to sit across the table from Xi Jinping. And I will handle Xi Jinping the same way that I will be handling my fellow politicians on that stage, which is to say with authority and with strength. And I take a lot of those attacks as a badge of honor. And I also want to say this, that they're good people. Right? I'm going to need many of those people on that stage in different roles in reviving our country. But when it comes to the White House, it will take an outsider. I think we established that tonight. And I was honored to come out, I think, is, you know, I, I, think, I think clearly the winner of this thing, just to be really honest of it. My first time ever on a debate stage, I was prepared for this to be a warm-up. The fact that we came out as victorious as we did is really an honor, something that propels me and gives me a sense of duty to see all this all the way through to a landslide in the general. No, I was just standing up for the conservative agenda that I've always stood for throughout my life. Uh, and where I saw people on the stage that are just wrong about American leadership in the world or wrong about policy here at home, I thought it was important to call it out. Look, elections are about choices. Uh, and I, I wanted the opportunity tonight not only to tell the American people that with all humility, I think I'm the most qualified, the most proven and tested conservative in this race today. I'm the person best equipped to turn this country around after the disastrous policies of the Biden administration. But I also wanted people to know that it's a very clear choice on that stage. And uh, I seized every opportunity I could take to draw those contrasts. And uh, I look forward to the next debate. Joining us now is our Washington correspondent, Maria Bird, to give us more on this. Hello, Maria. Hello, how are you? I'm very well. Let's see your smiling because I'm sure that was an interesting debate. But what was it like watching a Trumpless uh, debate last night? A debate without Mr. Trump? Well, there were quite a few on that stage last night. And as you said, it was a Trumpless debate. But I think it was almost necessary because it was a time for the American people to see that the Republican Party is really potentially going to have a multitude of candidates that could uh, be viable candidates um, for, their, uh, for the general election. So this was actually potentially a 
a good thing uh, for the Republican Party as they're able to kind of weed through who will be their top runner, especially as we look toward what um, the former president is up against today. And obviously has been up against for several months now with these indictments. Um, but I think it does not uh, take away from the fact that even with last night's debate, he still remains at the top uh, for where the general public believes who should be the front runner for the Republican Party. But the former president does bring with him, I mean, some entertainment and showbiz to debates. That's what he's known for. But more importantly, he's supposed to turn himself in to the Fulton County Jail today. What has been the reaction around that issue? I think the American people are quite honest, not surprised. Um, we knew this was coming down at some point. Uh, Georgia, we know, was the focal point in so much of election uh, season. And also, as you talk about the potential fraud with election and all the things that he's being indicted for. The real question, though, is with him turning himself in, will this be any different than what we've seen before? And I think that is the question. There has been no bail of it allowed for him at this time. Um, and so he will not be able to do any bail. So what is this going to look like? Is it going to look any different? Are we not going to see you know, cameras inside? Are we not going to see any mug shots taken? What is going to be different than before? We know that he has been indicted, they write forth charges, but he's pretty much gone home directly after that. So is this potentially going to look different than the other indictments before? I think that's what the American people are waiting to see is how Georgia plans to handle this, especially if we're talking about something as serious as potential uh, voter and election fraud. And you're talking about many of his confidants also being indicted uh, with this as well. Well, Maria, we know there were loads of back and forth during that debate, but what salient points were made during the debate by the contestants? In January 6th came up quite a bit. Uh, the former president came up quite a bit. So as you talk about, you know, uh, where he is and where he stands as far as the Republican Party, he was a great, he was a large part of the conversation. So his name was still being brought forth. And so that still obviously gives him potentially a push on this election cycle. But the main areas that we're focused in on was around those who were trying to show their separation from the former president, namely the former Vice President Pence. Uh, really focusing on himself being a conservative, focusing himself on being the, the values of the Republican Party. You also saw the former Governor Christie also being very clear and really trying to be more centric and potentially pulling in independent and Democratic voters who might not be happy with the current administration. Uh, there was obviously a lot of focus on how the current administration and the current president, they believe is weakening uh, the, the American um, value. They believe that he's not showing strength for it with his foreign adversaries. And so that was a huge focal point. And obviously the economy, focusing on the fact that we have seen historic inflation rates, uh, some that we've not seen in over 40 years. So that obviously were areas that they focused on as well. So those highlights were really about either alignment with the former president, those who are looking for those Trump supporters to, to jump on the bandwagon with them, or showing a very distinct difference in the former president and the conservative values and really trying to push themselves forward like the, form, like the former Vice President Pence. And then really focusing on the economic issues and focusing on some of what the Biden administration has been challenged with. But Maria, from what you saw last night from that debate, from comments on the streets, from people's reactions after that debate, is it safe to pick out a winner from last night? I think we're a long way from a winner. Um, there were so many on that stage. Um, and as you noted, the former president not being on that stage, I think does kind of lend us to not knowing who would be the winner. I think when you talk about who were some of the surprises um, on the stage, there was a young gentleman that's new, uh, that's kind of what they consider a Washington outsider uh, that has been very vocal. I think you saw you all run a clip of him earlier. So I think those were some surprises. But to say we have a front runner, I think it's a little premature and it's really going to have to uh, let time tell. As, as you know, they were 14 months away from the election uh, season and really being able to see if there are going to be this many candidates uh, kind of making it all the way to the primary election season. All right. Thank you very much, Maria Bird, our Washington correspondent. I know definitely keep that story up and get more as it happens. Thank you.
Let's continue with other stories now. We head to California where four people, including a gunman, have been killed in a shooting at a biker's bar in California's Orange County. The Orange County Sheriff said in a post on the social media platform X that six more people were in the hospital after the shooter opened fire at the Cook's Corner Bar in Trabuco Canyon. But aerial footage carried by the local television showed the dozens of police and emergency vehicles parked at the scene of the crime on Wednesday evening. Local media also said a retired law enforcement officer opened fire at the bar and cited a news reporting agency from sources that the shooter had been shot by deputies. The sheriff's office has not released any detail about the shooter or how he was killed. The California governor's office said it was monitoring the shooting. Hi, it's 7.04 p.m. tonight. Our sheriff's dispatch received a call of a shooting occurring at Cook's Corner. At 7.06 p.m., our first deputies arrived on scene, and about 7.08 p.m., our deputies contacted a male subject who was armed with a gun. A deputy-involved shooting occurred, and the male subject was pronounced deceased at the scene. Our firefighter paramedics assessed multiple patients, ultimately transporting six patients to a local trauma center, some of whom did suffer gunshot wounds. In addition, we declared four patients deceased on scene. This is a tragedy our community will continue to deal with. Orange County Fire Authority and Orange County Sheriff are here to stand by together. Leaders of the Zimbabwean Opposition Party, the Citizen Coalition for Change, the CCC, have held a press conference in Harare to voice their dissatisfaction regarding the postponement of voting in their key areas of influence on Wednesday. Well, according to the presidential decree issued late Wednesday, Zimbabwe has extended voting in selected wards by one day after the late distribution of ballot papers delayed polling. What is disturbing is that uh, we had hoped that we would have a normal election. The election has not been normal. I think the chief election I think, has already indicated to you what our complaints and concerns are. In fact, I'm sure they told you that they opposed ZEC, but ZEC seems to be either weak, incapable, or out of capacity to deal with the issues that are supposed to be dealt with. Uh, because those issues that were raised has not been addressed by ZEC. Uh, it's a cause for concern. Uh, ZEC seems to have confirmed our fears that they will probably fail to pass the credibility test, the professionalism test, the independence test, and the constitutionality test. That's Nelson Chamisa, who's the main opposition leader in Zimbabwe. Let's head to other stories now. We head to Mecca, where the famous clock tower was struck by lightning on Wednesday, following a period of high winds and widespread flooding in the surrounding neighborhood. Well, footage features the tower strike itself, as well as the intense weather conditions over the city and crowds of Muslim believers circling the Kaaba at the center of the Grand Mosque. In response to the heavy rainfall and weather that affected several regions of Saudi Arabia, authorities in Mecca also reportedly made the decision to keep schools closed on Wednesday. The Saudi Arabian National Center for Meteorology also declared the presence of cumulus thunder clouds in the areas of Asir, Jazan, Al Baha, and Maka. And these clouds were predicted to progress westwards, bringing the possibility of substantial rainfall accompanied by hail and head high winds. Amidst fierce competition within the beauty industry, a newly established nail salon in Shanghai has taken an unconventional approach to stand out, employing hunky men as manicurists. Within the salon, fitness instructors have transitioned into nail manicurists and hand massage experts. The salon's unique and attention-grabbing concept appears to be enjoying considerable success. Gaining acceptance in the crowded industry and the owner is even considering expanding the business into a nationwide chain.
没有，我是学这个。你看我刚刚都一直，还使劲儿。这边是机器Quite interesting to experience that. But that's a wrap on the world today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Anne Wawadu.